Welcome to the Insomnia Project. Sit back, relax, and listen as we have a conversation about the ordinary, about just about anything. Our conversation will be hopefully less than fascinating so that you can feel free to just drift off, relax, and maybe even find some sleep. Thank you for joining us. We hope you will listen and sleep. Follow us at Listen and Sleep. I'm your host, Marco Timpano, and joining me is one of my dearest friends, Natasha Lovato. Welcome. Thank you, Marco. It is always a pleasure to spend time with you and now be able to share some of our conversation with many, many, many listeners. Oh, thank you. You know, Natasha and I did a radio show at our university years and years and years ago. So this isn't your first time in front of a microphone. Not my first time at the rodeo, no. no. Have you ever been to a rodeo? You know what? It's always been on my list of things to do. I've been to Calgary um, mm-hmm. and and always missed the stampede. <laughs> it seemed like it was always just before or just after. And I thought it'd be actually kind of interesting to, t- to check it out one time. You know, I, I love the boots, love the hat. The accessories are great. So why wouldn't it be good to uh, experience the barbecue and the uh, the accents? What about riding horses? Are you someone who enjoys riding horses or going horseback riding? I have been a few times, actually. Um, spent a couple of visits in Cuba. And, of course, one of those great... Uh, activities you can take up is horseback riding and they take you through the lovely countryside Mm -hmm. and uh and then hopefully you don't fall off that's the the main point is not to crack your skull open what did you see on these horseback journeys in cuba oh well you're taken on to a farm that is local run by the local uh, caballeros and you will spend your time figuring out how a to get onto the horse and then hopefully get off the horse safely it's the okay. most dangerous times they'll tell you to get on and off your horse oh, i see and then there's a trail that you walk meander through the oh. local forest um and see if you're lucky some other animals along the way and then make your way back it's not really something that's um something like out of a movie it's sure. much calmer it's meant for just a little relaxation for those of us who are still kind of new to horseback riding there's nothing nicer than riding a horse and seeing a different vista that you would normally see in a different country with uh, you know the different sights and sounds around certainly i mean when you see a forest though you do get i always feel a little homesick canada has such beautiful greenery and uh not only do you get to do that if you're lucky enough to be on a horse but if you get to do some of the trails uh, in and around the city here in toronto but well, so what are some trails that you've experienced? Some of um, your favorite trails? Oh, up into, um, spent some time up in the Algonquin Park, which is about what, three and a half hours from the city. So okay. it's not a bad ride if you're not, you know. On okay, so once weekend. you get there, what was your experience? Oh, um, camping. So we did some camping and portaging, which is basically. Yeah, for our international listeners. Yes, we need to t- We need to explain <laughs> the beauty that is portaging. Ah, well, it certainly is. Something that will teach you a lesson about how much you can carry on your back. Because okay. everything that you carry will be what you will be using. So if you don't mind carrying that extra flask of whatever or the bag of makeup or the uh, too many clothes that you think you're going to need for the trip, then you're well more than welcome to do so. But what about, okay, so as I understand it, portaging involves one key element Right, your canoe. The canoe, right? Right, not just your canoe, but that your canoe is not just your vehicle for taking you from place to place, but it's also the vehicle in which you put all the things that you're taking from those places. So when you're not in the water, you're carrying it, which is the idea of portaging it, you're mm-hmm. carrying over the land portions of your trip before you can get back into water. Correct me if I'm wrong, Natasha, because to be quite honest, I've never portaged, at least not in the last while that I can remember. Um, how exactly does one portage? You put the canoe on your shoulders, so there's one person in the front and one person in the back? At least two to portage, okay. if it's a large canoe. Okay. And you're basically going to put everything else in your pack, All right. and you're going to put that on, and then you're going to put, you're going to flip the canoe upside down so that your head is in the canoe, and the, where you normally sit is actually what's sitting on your shoulders. I see. And then you're walking through the woods. Hopefully slowly, <laughs> over gentle terrain, but that doesn't always be, seem to be the case. Sure. And then hopefully it's a short walk before you get to the other side of wherever you are landlocked into to get to water again. And then you flip the boat down, take your packs off, 
pack everything back in the boat, and then make your way again out into the water. Okay, so now we've got the canoe in the water. Right. Right? Tell me about, or tell our listeners about canoeing. Because we haven't really talked about that on this show. (laughs) So there's always somebody who is at the front who is going to be the one that, who guides the canoe right or left. Okay. So they're going to be the ones that move their oars back and forth right to the left, left hand side, who tell you right or left. And the one in the back who's going to be the more powerful of the two rowers, because they're going to be the ones that actually push the canoe forward the most. They'll steer, right? Are they steering or? The steerers are more at the front. Okay. Yes, because they're going to be the ones that are going to move to the right or to the left. And then they, they do it. Advise. They're supposed to communicate well with the people in the back, with the person in the back, to say, we're going to go right or we're going to go left. Uh, and then the, the one at the back is the powerhouse that pulls the canoe forward. And there's different strokes you can do with the paddle, or the oar, I should That's say, right. in the water. Like there's the J stroke, mm-hmm. there's the other strokes that I don't know, <laughs> but uh, there's a bunch of different strokes that you right. can do when yes. you're canoeing. Yeah. N- now, let me ask you this, Natasha. Is... Actually being on the water in Algonquin Park, canoeing, as wonderful as photos that I've seen Mm -hmm. make it seem. Yes, it is, actually. There are parts of the park that are very isolated, and if you're lucky enough to and courageous enough to make your way further into the depth of the park and not where the general five or six main areas for camping are where a lot of families hang out and go further into the park with a lot of portaging. So I hate to say it, you're going to be carrying a lot of stuff. Sure. <laughs> so carry very little um, and make sure it's all waterproofed um, because you will be in the water at some point, whether it's voluntary or involuntary that you are going to make your way into parts of wilderness that are incredibly beautiful and still some of the last parts of wilderness in Ontario. So please, if you get a chance, you do want to do a little uh, canoeing Everyone says this. Everyone says you really need to go canoeing in Algonquin Park. What did you see while you were canoeing? Did you see any animals? Did you see, you know, the reflection in the water? I mean, the water is very clear still, which is lovely. Uh, you get a quiet stillness that you're going to experience. If you're quiet enough, you will get a chance to see lovely um, um, moose that may be peering into the into the lake, getting their drink of water for the morning or the afternoon. You'll see smaller animals um, that hang out and are curious to see what's going on in the water. You might see some uh, birds on the lake itself, especially depending on what time of year you happen to be there. Maybe some fish jumping. Uh, well, I don't know, you see flying fish in the lake. No, not but, flying, oh, flying fish. You might see fish see... in the water, yes. Yeah. yeah, there are there are fish in the water. People do do fishing as well in Algonquin Park. And um, you, you know, it's basically as long as you make yourself part of nature, you will see lots of nature. There you go. What a great great way to sum that up now let me ask you this what about building a fire are you a good fire starter fire builder well i've learned um sort of some of the basics of fire building okay. um you always still want to have a backup even though everybody thinks they're going to be grizzly atoms so they're going to be everything subsistence you know that they're going to be able to build it with you know a, a stick and a, two rocks sure. and a little bit they're going to start fire from scratch Uh, Nine times out of ten, you're still going to need some matches. But um, the idea, even with matches, you still need to make sure you're using dry materials as a base, especially if you're going to find some dry brush, some grass, things like that as your base. Then you're going to add, you're going to start a flame with that. You're going to add smaller sticks. And then above that, you're going to add your larger pieces as the flames become larger. And there's nothing like a lovely wood-burning um, fire that keeps you nice and toasty warm on an evening to most your marshmallows. Oh, man. Is there nothing nicer to be in nature, you know, by mm-hmm. a lake or a river, fire going, marshmallows roasting, maybe some s'mores with friends just around a warm fire? Really, honestly, it's one of those Canadian experiences that is not to be missed. And if uh, your summer is spent always at a barbecue in your backyard, maybe this year would be a good year to start thinking even a small, you know, weekend away with an organized group who will help you get your feet wet in the idea of canoeing and camping would be a good way to start. And you will, once you do it, I'm sure that it's one of those things you'll want to do at least once a year. And you may even dip your feet into the idea of fall or winter camping if you get very adventurous have you ever done winter camping i haven't done winter camping i have gone in late 
September, okay. which is cool-ish sure. enough. That is, you definitely have to make sure you wear enough warm clothing of for course. it because it gets chilly at night. And you want to make sure that fire is going for sure at night. Uh, but it is on my list is to try a winter camp because it is something to experience if you like uh, living in the outdoors. Have you ever snowshoed? Actually, I haven't. And in fact, we were just watching some great um, uh, documentaries around the the incredible uses of snowshoes in terms of being out on the snow, which is either lightly or heavily packed, right. where you would have such a much harder time going through in boots, but you could actually literally sitting on top of the, walking on top of the snow, which is amazing to yeah. me. Yeah, I've, I've had the opportunity to go snowshoeing. And it is this peaceful, lovely trek that you can do uh, with all this white snow around you. And basically, the way I experienced it was, you know, you, you're you you're walking with your snowshoes, so you can't walk you know, at a normal yeah. pace. Mm-hmm. You're walking at a different pace. Mm-hmm. And they're larger than your shoes, right? So you're, you're, you're getting used to that. And you sink a little bit, Natasha. Mm-hmm. So it, it's not like you're like floating. floating. Okay. You sink a bit. And you don't realize how on top of the snow you are with the snowshoes until you make the mistake that I did was to take the snowshoe off. (laughs) And then my foot all the way up to the knee sank. And then you can't, like, if you thought it was difficult to walk with the snowshoes, imagine how difficult it is to walk without them. So I quickly put the snowshoe back on and made my way peacefully through the snow and the 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 woods the light woods I guess you would say mm-hmm. um, and had a great time yeah I mean if you look at just the shape of it and you think when you see birds um, who've been walking on snow and right. you see how light their step seems to be because they you'd think they'd sink you know and then you look at the fact that their feet are splayed and so that's the same idea that's in a snowshoe it's giving more weight over a larger space and so it helps to balance out um, it keeps you from sinking so mm-hmm. much. And so, yes, I don't I, I, uh It's one of those things I'd like to try, but it's one of those things you kind of train to because it doesn't, it, it looks easier than it happens to be. Is there an outdoor activity that you really enjoy doing that we haven't mentioned so far? Is there something that you're like, oh, you know what I love doing? And whether or not you did, you've done it in a while. It's so much winter. No, it doesn't we, have to be we winter. Went, it can be any time of the year. Mushrooming. <gasps> I love mushrooming. I love I used to go, mu- see, I would call it mushroom picking, but is it called mushrooming? I don't know. I mean, I would, basically it's mushroom picking. I, sure. I, I just like saying mushrooming because it okay, just so sounds nicer. <laughs> tell me about your mushrooming experience and then I'll tell you about mine. Okay. So we've been actually um, a couple of times with a, a couple we know who have, and apparently it is this hugely secretive society of people who know where to go pick mushrooms because... Apparently, Southern Ontario has lots of places where you can go, except no one will tell you where to go to get the mushrooms because sure. they're all worried you're going to steal all their mushrooms and they won't find any mushrooms ever again. Okay, before we go further, because I want to also talk about truffle hunting because I've been and I think you've been as well. Have you not uh, in no, Piedmont? No, I haven't oh. been, but I do know a lot about okay. a fair bit about it. So yes. what I want to say first and foremost is do not go out and picking mushrooms if you're not aware of what mushrooms you can and yes. cannot eat. So I want to make that disclaimer now, Natasha, <laughs> uh, for our listeners. We're not advising... Is that going to be a whole different show? No, we're not advising any of that, but we're going to just tell you about our mushrooming experience. So sorry, mm-hmm. Natasha, I, no, I cut no, you off. Good. But... No, you're quite right, because before you go mushrooming, that's one of the reasons actually why you should go with someone who already knows a, lo- a location, because they'll basically know to tell you which ones to pick and which not to pick. Great. Because there are certain areas will carry certain mushrooms, won't carry other mushrooms and Fair. the ones you want to pick are one type and not another exactly so and your experience you, so you yes go with... we yes we went we packed up we had a lovely afternoon we it was a stunningly beautiful day we get to the location it also happens to be a location where a lot of dirt bike riders are which sure. is interesting so that's a fine they have a trail and then you go into this beautifully pine wooded area where it's, I think it was about mid-September it was, and oh, that the, 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 the pine trees have let some of their um, uh, dead leaves or, or um, the, I forget what they're called, the, the pine... The pine needles? The pine needles, yes, hit the ground, so it's a full floor of that. It's nice and soft um, pine needle floor, and apparently these mushrooms thrive growing underneath that area. Okay. And so the problem is, is that you don't see them quite easily. Of so you're not. doing a lot of with a stick, you have to get a good stick. 
Hey, we're then at this point we're mushroom hunting. Like yes, it's not you're they're, hunting. It's not just like they're giving them to you. No, here. you've got to work. <laughs> so you're supposed to look for particular raised mounds in the ground. And you've got a nice stick, you see. You got a good stick. You everybody gets you have to find your own stick. That's part of the whole deal. And you find a nice uh, broken branch. You're not going to cut one off a tree because the idea is everything is supposed to be already dead that you're picking. Thank you, Natasha. So um, you're going to basically look for the right kind of mound, and then you sort of try to push away the pine needles and underneath. Without without lucky, damaging the mushroom, right? So you've got to right. be so gentle. gentle. So you're sort of seeing where the empty hole is, kind of, and you think, okay, that may be where it is. You bend over and you brush away some of the pine needles, and hopefully if you're lucky, you find a lovely little pile of uh, mushrooms. You're going to pluck each one separately, and then you carry, just like Little Red Riding Hood, her little basket. There's of a course. reason why you carry the little basket, and you drop them gently into the buck, into the basket or Like bucket. a rattan or wicker basket is yes, what we're exactly. talking you about. Yes, Because they're very delicate. You sure. don't want to be crushing them. And uh, and then hopefully you find lots and lots of them. We did find a fair number, not as many as we wanted that year. Did our, and then we have to be careful also, because even though the woods are very safe you may get lost quite easily so you need someone who is a woods person and knows knows their ways in and out and you have to know to make sure to keep communicating with each other so you say we're going to the right or we're going to the left okay and then you're calling for them every once in a while because we at one point had the other couple my husband and the, our friend's husband was somewhere way further ahead and we didn't know where they were so we oh. basically headed back to the main trail and then waited for them because we knew they'd find their way oh, back that's wonderful you know um when I used to go, mm-hmm. I used to go when I was a child. My right. father and my uncle mm-hmm. would take me mushroom, and me and my cousin, mushroom hunting or mushrooming mm-hmm. or mushroom picking, however you want to describe it. And we used to go into the forest, and my uncle was great at identifying mushrooms. So mm-hmm. he knew what the mushrooms were that we could and could not pick mm-hmm. and could and could not eat. And for me, it was so much fun. I used to yodel. I used to I used to practice my yodeling and I remember my uh-huh. dad and my uncle would look at each other like where did this kid learn to yodel right and you know it, I don't know where it came from Natasha but I would I would be in the forest some ancestral yodel yeah some sort of you know intrinsic Primal yodel. ancestral uh, yodel Primal that yodel. was in my you know in, in, in my soul mm-hmm. but I used to and it was beautiful because you'd be in the forest mm-hmm. It would be just you and your family and you'd be walking around and feeling the earth beneath your feet as Mm -hmm. you would like walk and feel the crunch and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would just let out these yodels as only a a kid (laughs) could. And that was my... Lucky mushrooms aren't scared of yodels. No, they they certainly (laughs) They don't run away. Now, here's something interesting for our listeners. So both you and I, our backgrounds are Italian and Mm -hmm. from a particular, the same area of Italy Mm -hmm. where porcini mushrooms... Yes, are from. Yes. Are from. So, Natasha, I would love to go (gasps) porcini mushroom hunting with you one time. Yes. In the future. Apparently, there are porcini mushrooms in Ontario. I don't believe it. <laughs> I keep hearing I heard that there's of... some in California. <laughs> if our California listeners can chime in, I think, yes. and maybe I'm wrong, mm-hmm. maybe I'm biased, you can only get porcini mushrooms in southern Italy. Well, this is the whole debate because mm-hmm. I have had, we, we had a discussion last weekend with, with some who? friends. With some friends who okay. are big, also mushroomers Trustworthy too. friends? Trustworthy. And they okay. say, yes, that they have picked porcini mushrooms in the past here in Ontario. So it's a matter of timing, and hopefully it's a location that still exists with all the development that's happening. Sure. Sometimes those wooded areas, unfortunately, are going bye-bye for right. housing developments. That if uh, he, if, he's, if he's correct and it still exists, we were saying to him, we would love to see if we could check out to see if they're still existing. Okay, can we try, Natasha? Because yes. for me, this Ontario Porcini is kind of like the Yeti. I don't <laughs> believe it's there until I see it with my own eyes. So if you and I can find a way, if not this year, mm-hmm. sometime in the yes. future to go Porcini mushroom hunting, I w- sure. it would be a thrill of mine. Well, definitely would make it a date. All right, let's jump from Porcini or Porcino mushrooms um, or the Porcino to truffles. Ah, truffles. Now, I've been truffle hunting. The king of fungi. Yes. <laughs> and um, it's not as nice as mushroom pit hunting, I think. Well, because you're going with it's a, a bit dog, more passive, it's, right? You're not yeah. as active. You're, the dog is doing all the work. The dog is doing the work, and you have to dig. Like it, the the truffles are not as um, apparent or not as because they're underground, right? Yeah. So there's your digging here, and that means the dog it's, is digging here. And I think 
for as much as I've seen, I've heard about truffle hunting and I've tasted truffles before. And you've, to be fair, mm-hmm. you've organized tours yes. for people who yes. wanted to truffle hunt. Right. So you, part you, of their trip was yeah, doing you, a, a, an afternoon with a gentleman and his dog truffle hunting. Right. Right. Which, you know, truffle hunting is usually done with not a, tw- you know, not a group of 20 people. Um, and because the dog gets a little bit skittish you know, sure, around sure. lots of people. And sometimes those locations have been seeded, I hate to tell you. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, fair enough. Well, we hate to break the news to those people who so, went on Natasha's so just, tours. So that, it's, so that it was obvious that, ooh, look, they could find a truffle. But um, that, uh, the, that area of Italy in Piemonte is quite often the location where some of the most expensive and prized truffles are gotten. The, the elusive uh, the white elusive, mushroom. Yeah, the white truffle, oh, which sorry, is, especially truffle. in October, is a huge time frame when they do a festival. And there's a huge, it's, it's like basically the, I guess, the, the cans of, uh, of, of mushrooms, you know, a set of movies. Everybody's, all the stars are heading out to that area in order to have special plates done by gourmet chefs with truffles. So whatever they can, especially the white truffle. Is that why you think the city or town of Alba has so many great chefs in it? Is it because oh, of the truffle industry, you think, Natasha? I think it's a mix of both the truffle industry, but also the fact that there's so many good um uh, local ingredients that are used. It is the 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 area where the home of the slow food movement was created or was re I guess recognized. Sure. And so the slow food movement being where everybody's looking to spend more time and more care in how they prepare, they search for and prepare food, um, and that is looking ideally the whole idea of more local, more genuine, and more uh, genuinely prepared. Um, items in your food so everything from the pasta that's on your plate to the tomato that's in your salad to the the steak that's on your plate as well so the fact that so many great high-end chefs especially michelin star ones in the area is not to be surprised okay. plus when you have great ingredients to begin it with makes things it makes it so much, so much easier. easier and, and that's pl- that's the town of Alba in Piemonte. Yes. I just wanted to mention. Yes. Now, Natasha. It's also the home of, as we know, some of the most sought-after chocolate in Italy is in that area as well. Oh. Yes. And Alba, not too far from Alba, is where the home of where every hazelnut in the country came from. So hazelnuts are also local to the of area. Course. Yes. And that's in various products, especially chocolate products. Yes. Things like, you know, the lovely bocce that we love to eat and the other chocolate products that come and from that area. Did you ever have a bicherine when you were in Piemonte? Yes. In fact, I have a bicherine here in the Toronto. I have in a tiramisu that we made as well this evening. Which we'll be having for our listeners who, who are wondering, <laughs> what's Marco going to eat after he does this podcast? <laughs> Natasha and her husband made me some glorious tiramisu. With bicherine. With bicherine. So I can't wait for that. Yes. Uh, we should explain what the bicherine is yes. to our listeners. So Do bich- you want to? If I, I could start. So basically, right. bicherine is a very um, locally native d- dessert drink for uh, people in Piemonte. Nice and, and Piemonte, heartwarming. You know, we're talking about it like we expect everyone to know, to know where, where it is. It's the northwestern part of Italy. So the principal city would be Torino, which yes. would be the place that uh, the Olympics happened. So a lot of people recognize That's it right. for that. So Turin. So, mm-hmm. so Turin or Torino mm-hmm. is the principal city of this region of Italy that we're talking That's about. Right. Take it away, Natasha. That's right. So it's the home also of local liqueurs. Like you're going to have your Asti Spumante, which is a nice bubbly, sweet uh, dessert drink. Uh, you'll have um, uh, Barolo wines, which are sure. some, we argue, are some of the we best. We don't have time to talk about that. Let's get back to the But bich- the lovely bich- is a wonderful chocolatey, nutty liqueur that is often accompanied or added to a number of desserts, which include lovely tiramisu that we're having this evening. I know the bicherine is this. Okay, so if you go to a bar in Piemonte, you can have your cappuccino, you can have your latte, you can have your espresso, or you can have a bicherine, Mm -hmm. which is coffee with chocolate, but not in the sense of it's well-proportioned, and then you have the... um, the, the steamed milk as well with it. And I've only ever seen it in Piemonte. Mm-hmm. And it is something definitely to have. I loved it when I was having well, the beach it's, it's, it's double caffeine, the yeah. chocolate and the coffee. And then and there's an alcohol in it, too. It's to, to, a nice kick as well. Like a like a liqueur, like a... a uh, 
a, a strong liqueur. Yes, it's not quite. It's not quite. A, it's, it's it's a hazelnut uh, liqueur. Yes, that's right. It's a, it's it's a, a hazelnut, hazelnut liqueur. liqueur. So that's what gives that nice. And the hazelnuts being local to the area there you go. are all from that. You know, Natasha, it's funny. I like the Janduya chocolate mm-hmm. is the chocolate from that area that's yes. in that uh, coffee drink. Yes. We've come to the end of this episode, and I wanted to get to vineyards. You and I, mm-hmm. and, I and I don't know how this happened, folks. <laughs> I've known Natasha for, for many, many years. years. She's one of my closest, dearest <laughs> friends. But we've been in vineyards in both Italy yes. and in France. That's right. And you'll just have to wait for the next episode when we talk about our experiences in vineyards. Oh, yes. N- Natasha, thank you so much. Thank for- you. Always a pleasure to talk to you, and hopefully... Um, give your listeners a wonderful taste of what there is out there. Thank you. As always, the Insomnia Project is produced by Drumcast Productions. Until next time.